All right. So um, sorry for being late. I was out of town and I rushed to get. I'm sweating. If that's any consolation, the effort I put out to get here was uh, immense. All right. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to wait for the power cable to come. Um, it, we should last that long. I've, I've uh, sent a courier to go procure the power cable, and then we should be all right. So I was going to start by finishing this lecture. You might recall this was a lecture that I was talking about differential equation models. And then we got sidetracked because I needed to do certain materials so you could do the homework. So I wanted to finish this today and then start another one, which I probably won't finish. And so we, basically the idea here is we were writing out differential equation models and just trying to give you some experience in doing that. So in addition to talking about how to solve differential equation models, we'd like to know how to formulate them, right? Write out the equations. Because if you don't have an equation to solve, you don't need to know how, about how to solve it. Um, so we went through a couple of examples. You may or may not remember. We did these storage tanks and storage tanks in series. And then I did this um, heating system. And I left off with this. This is where I'm going to pick up. And then uh, we'll get caught back up at some point, but we won't worry now. I mean, it would help if I showed up on time getting caught up. All right. I don't think any of these are germane to us, so we will erase, except this, of course. All right, so I want to start with this example, which I started, but then I, I, I abandoned ship halfway through or partway through because I knew I couldn't finish it. So this is a case where you're just mixing two streams. So this is a mass flow to the first stream, mass flow to the second stream. And this is a binary system, so we have one, let's say, mole fraction. Or sorry, these are mass flow rates, so we use mass fractions. If you had mass flow rates, you'd use mass fractions. <laughs> let's say these are mass flow rates and mass fractions. This is the first stream. That's its flow rate. And this is the mass fraction of one of the two components. Call it component A. It doesn't matter. Okay? Because obviously, you know that if you have two components and these are mass fractions, that you know this is true. Right, so if we, if we, for example, write all the equations, sorry, for that, then we can always figure that out later. So this is just for one of the components, obviously. Um, and so we're going to mix these two streams up in the tank here. Um, and we'll be interested in what comes out of the tank. What is the flow rate coming out and what's the composition coming out, OK? And for this particular system, we, we will not, we'll assume that the level might vary as well, OK? So, and we're going to make this assumption. We're going to assume the system is well mixed, which is what we normally do. OK, so if you look at this and you think, what kind of balances do you need to write, um, you, should you should always write an overall mass balance. So we need an overall mass balance. And based on the fact we're mixing streams together to, you know, with mass fractions, you'd probably assume we need a component balance of some type. OK. Uh, probably don't need an energy balance because I'm not talking about temperatures or anything like that. No need for a momentum balance. So let's start with the overall mass balance, which is here. Right? And you remember the equation, right? It's accumulation equals N minus out plus generation. Genera uh, ma mass is not generated. These are the two mass flows in. So every term in this equation is going to have mass per unit time. So these are mass flow rates, like kilograms per second, if you like SI units or something like that. Uh, pounds per hour if you're using typical English units, for example. So those are the, that's the two flows in, right? And this is the flow out. So if these, if these flows are perfectly balanced, then the mass will not accumulate in the tank. But if they're not balanced, then it will accumulate. And so everyone, I think, can write um, the steady state version of this equation, which is this derivative equals 0 equals that. But if you want the dynamic version, which means you account for the accumulation, then you have to write you have to include here what's accumulating. And so what I've written here is V is the volume of fluid in this tank. It's A times H, right? A is a cylindrical tank. So A is a cross-sectional area. A is the, sorry, H is the liquid level. So V is the liquid volume in there. And if you multiply that times the density of the fluid, that's mass. And if you take the derivative of that, that's mass per time. Okay, So every term in the equation is mass per time. All right. Um, We'll assume that the density is constant. We'll also assume the cross-sectional area is constant. So we can, you know, I substitute A times H here, pull out row A and divide by row A, and you get that equation there. We like to write the equation this way because on the left-hand side, we usually just want the derivative, nothing else. Okay? So there's a, there's a differential equation that describes how the level changes with time. Okay? And to solve this, obviously, I would need to know these flows, density, area, and also have to know some initial conditions on that. Okay.
Nothing new there. All right, component balance. So we're going to write basically the same equation, but instead of doing it for overall mass, we'll do it for the mass of, let's say, component A. Okay. So for example, if you look at this term here, this is the flow of component A in through the first stream, right? It's the mass times the mass fraction. Okay, so that's the amount of A coming in the first stream. That's the amount of A coming in the second stream. This is the amount of A exiting through the exit stream. Okay. And again, if we want to count for accumulation, then we have to write in a, on the left-hand side what is actually accumulating. So if rho V is the mass in the tank, which I showed you on the previous slide, rho V times X3 is the, the um, mass of component A in the tank. Right? So it's the mass times the mass fraction. The key thing here is, I'm oh, going to go back here a second, because we assume the system is well mixed, the concentration coming out is the same as the concentration in the tank. Right? If it wasn't well mixed, that wouldn't be true. All right? So here's our component balance. Now, the key thing here is um, you have to recognize that, OK, V is A times H. H changes with time, and X3 changes with time. So there's two things that change with time in that term there. Okay. And so usually, for, for a problem like this, we're really going to seek a model that looks like this. We already have the first equation, dh dt equals whatever. Okay. Now we want an equation that looks like dx3 dt equals 0 equals whatever. Okay. So that means I need to manipulate this derivative on the left-hand side so that it involves only x3. Okay. So that's what I'm doing in this next step. So you guys remember the product rule, I hope? Okay. So the idea here is that I'm going to break this into two terms, right? Rho V and then the derivative of X3 and then X3 times the derivative of Rho V, OK? Just using the product rule. Um, so keep this term. Now, you know that the derivative of Rho V is it's on the previous slide, OK? It's those three flows. If you just look at there's an equation for the derivative of Rho V on the previous slide, it's equal to W1 plus W2 minus W3. So I'm just substituting that thing in right there, OK? So I break this derivative into two parts, and I know what this is from the mass balance. I substitute it in, and now I have this. Okay? Now this thing here is the left-hand side of this, right? So what I've done here is just substitute this in for the whole left-hand side right there, and there's the right-hand side. Okay? All right, so if you look at these terms, some things will cancel. Let's see. Maybe only one thing cancels. Here you have a minus W3x3, and here you also have a minus W3x3, so those will cancel on both sides of the equation. So what else have I done here? I've gathered terms involving W1. So I have, right, I have a W1, X1, and I have a term W1, X3. I pulled that over the left-hand side. That's where I got that term. I did the same thing for the two terms involving W2 to get that term. The W3 terms canceled. And then I wrote this derivative out here, rho. Right, I wrote this as A times H, and then I divided through to get that. So there's a little algebra to go from there to there. Um, what you have to be sure you never do is the following for a problem like this. If you have okay, you, you should not do just pull rho v out, right? Because that's not correct because v is a function of time because it's a v depends on h and h is a function of time from the previous slide, right? From the mass balance, so. This is not correct. So you have to pull, take this derivative, separate it in two parts using the product rule, substitute in the mass balance, and then you'll get your equation. OK? Yeah? You can't pull rho out, right? Yeah, rho's fine. Okay. I just write it this way because I happen to have the derivative of rho v in the so I just, Yeah, but you could certainly pull rho out. Yeah, that's fine. All right. All right, so here we have two equations, right? So I don't know if I have that. Yep, there it is. Two equations, one for h, one for x3. Each of these would need initial, initial condition. These two equations are coupled together, right? Because you can see h, this equation here depends on h. This equation actually doesn't depend on x3, but this equation does depend on h. Um, and let's see if we think this equation, well, this equa these equations are nonlinear, right? Because for an equation to be linear, both the right-hand sides would have to be linear in, in um, h and x3. So that's what I mean by linear. On the right-hand side, h, the two dependent variables, h and x3, would have to appear linearly. And they clearly don't, because you're dividing by h. Okay? 
So these equations are not linear. Um, and to solve these would mean uh, you would want to find out how the level changes with time and, and uh, the flow rate changes with time. All right? Okay. So now we're going to do a couple of reactor examples. Um, and um, I'm going to try to explain enough about this. Um, so I do, I do problems in kind of kinetics and reaction engineering and stoichiometry and stuff because I figure of all the classes you didn't take, that's the most likely you are to know something from like chemistry and stuff like that. So if I mean, if I took things from like fluid dynamics or mass transport or heat transfer, I don't think you've seen that stuff at all. So that's why I'm choosing these problems. It's just not that easy for me to come up with mass balance problems over and over again <laughs> that have no reaction and you know, mixing fluids of different temperatures. You can only do that so much. So, um, so I'm trying to give you enough background to, to understand this particular problem. Okay. So this guy over here is a reactor. Looks cool. Obviously, I stole this, right? I would never draw a picture of that quality. Um, so this is a batch reactor. So by batch reactor, what we mean is, for this case here, so here's the reactions we're going to perform, let's say. And I think we've seen this before. I made this up. So here are two reactants, A and B. They, they form a, a product C, and then C can further react with A to make D, and then B and C can react to make, make D. OK? So, um, so the idea here is if you wanted to conduct this reaction, right, you wouldn't do this in a, in a, like a flask. <laughs> Why? Well, because a flask is too small, and a flask is not control it doesn't have a controllable environment. So if you want to do this on a large scale, you do it in a big reactor like this. This reactor might be, you know, 10,000 gallons or something like that. Oh, she got my charger. <laughs> Believe me, you're not the first person to have to do this. You're the second, actually. OK. All right. So now we can take solace in the fact I never have to stop. Uh-oh. She wants to turn in her homework, I guess. Um, all right. OK, so what we would do here is we would have a large reactor like this. Like I said, this might be you know 10,000 gallon reactor, so we can do this on a really large scale. And if you have something called a batch reactor, what you do is you basically charge the reactor with these two reactants. OK, you put them in there. They pr there's probably a catalyst involved. You guys ever study that in chemistry at all? Like cat catalysts lower the activation energy of reactions, so they'll take place. Okay, so you probably ch you know charge the two reactants A and B in the reactor with a catalyst. Then you just let the reaction take place for some period of time, and then at some time you stop the reaction and you take out the products and recover the products you want. Hopefully, okay. That's called a batch reactor. Okay, and that's basically what it says here. Time equals zero. You put some some A and B in there at concentrations. What I called C A naught and C B naught. You right. Because you want this reaction to take place, you can see you better have A and B, otherwise it won't even get started, right? Because both of those are reactants, not products. So you've got to put A and B in there, and then let the reaction proceed until some time, some final time, that's when you decide you're going to stop the reaction, OK? That might be, for example, you know the little problem you did, I guess it was yesterday, where you tried to find where C reached a peak, I think it was? You know, you might have some idea of when you should stop the reaction. Well, for this example, assume, well, it would be true. If you, if you don't feed liquid into this reactor and you don't withdraw liquid from this reactor and the density doesn't change, then the volume won't change of this reaction, right? So we can assume this is constant volume. And then to characterize the reaction rates, okay? So if we want to model this, we have to know how fast these reactions occur. It's called reaction kinetics or rates. And we might assume something that looks like this, okay? So you might say, so this is something called mass action kinetics. I don't know if you've ever seen that in chemistry or anything like that. But what we're, we're assuming here is the rate of this reaction is proportional to the concentrations of the reactants, right? And I didn't do that. All right. So for example, let's take this reaction. It's a little bit easier. We're going to say there's no rate constant there. I hate myself. No, I don't. I'm just kidding. That's just to mask my incompetence. I figure if you feel sorry for me, you'll still give me hard, high teaching evaluations, even if you think I'm incompetent. We'll see if it's true. I'll repost this, obviously. 
That looks better. Bang. Okay. So if we look at um, this, this reaction here, so what we're saying is that we think the reaction rate is proportional to the concentration of A and the concentration of C. Makes sense, right? You think if I put more A or more C in this, I probably get a higher reaction rate. And the proportionality constant is called the reaction rate constant. Okay. Now for a reaction like this, where A is there's two A molecules plus one B gives you a C, C A you get a C A squared. Okay. And that's why you see like a C cubed over here, concentration of C cubed. Okay. All right. So this isn't meant to teach you about reaction engineering, just to give you some idea of what we're doing here. All right. Now what I'm going to do is look at this system, and I'm going to decide what do I need to do? What kind of balances do I need to write? Well, I always write an overall mass balance, although for this case it's going to be pretty trivial, as you'll see. But I need balances on some of these, rea some of these species, right? And I'm going to write balances on A and B and C, but not D. Because if you know A, B, and C and this constant, you know, the mass, you'll see from the mass balance, you could always cal recalculate D, right? Because A, B, C, A plus B plus C plus D is all the mass. So you don't really, it would be redundant to write an equation on D. You'll learn this when you take reaction engineering. Okay. All right, so if we write out an overall mass balance, you get this. Pretty trivial, right? You say, well, you, so what are you doing? You're saying, what comes into the system? Nothing. There's no flow in. What comes out of the system? Nothing. Mass not generated. So the right-hand side is zero. So what's the rate at which mass is accumulated? Rho times V, right? Rho times V is the mass in the tank. Its derivative is the accumulation. So if rho times V is zero and you assume the density is zero, that means v, dV dt is zero. And that just means V is constant, <laughs> right? So vol just all you proved was volume doesn't change. No, no great surprise there. Okay. Now let's see if you guys agree with this. I'm going back here for a second. Um, see if you agree with this. If I, was, if I wanted to write a steady state mass balance, let's say on A. You see A here? Um, let's make sure that I don't screw this up. Okay. Um, if you wanted to write a steady state mass balance on component A with no, you would look at these equations and I think you'd say if it's steady state A doesn't accumulate and reaction one consumes two molecules or moles of A and reaction two I think consumes one molecule of A, right? And you'd get an equation that looks like this. We already did this earlier in the class. So the only difference now is I'm, I'm assuming that we're not at steady state. So this thing is not going to be zero now, okay? Because I'm going to allow A to accumulate maybe. And so if I do that, then you get an equation that looks like this, okay? So there's the minus 2 R1 minus R2. That's the rate at which A is consumed. A, no, no reaction produces A, okay? That's why you have to start with some A <laughs> because you, there's no way to get A. You have to start with some, okay? And so if we, if we say these are... Um, let's say uh, units of like mass per volume. These are concentrations, right? They'll usually be like grams per liter or something like that. You multiply times the volume, this will be mass. You take the derivative, that'll be mass per time, and these things are all mass per time, okay? All right, so I'm telling you, you pick these reaction rate constants, so these reaction rates are going to be, as you can see actually, their mass um, per unit volume per time. So they really have, these reaction rates have things like, if you like SI units, kilograms per second per hour, something like that. Okay? That's <laughs> uh, uh, That's one of the stupidest things I ever wrote. Okay. How about meters cubed per hour? That looks better. Or second, yeah. If you like SI units, you'd go for second here. I guess the point is mass per volume per time. Okay. So that means that if you want to look at this term here, this will have this, this will have, so these reaction rates, okay. So you, their reaction, the reaction rates I gave you on the previous page are per volume. So to get units of like mass Per time, you have to multiply times the volume of the reactor because all the reaction rates are per unit volume. Okay, so that's why I'm multiplying each of these by volume. 
And once you multiply each of these by volume, the rate constant is specified such that the units of this thing will be like kilograms per second. Okay? If you look at this term here, this will also have units, this will have units of kilograms, right? Because this will be like kilograms per meter cubed, and that's meters cubed, meters, and then you take the derivative, it's also mass per time. I'm just trying to convince you all units are mass per time. That's it. Okay? All right. So that would be the balance for, for um, A. And if you look at the balance for B, sorry, I have to go back here. You can see B is consumed in this reaction. It's also consumed in this reaction. So that's why there's a minus R1 and a minus R3. Again, B is never produced. It's only consumed. And then I've just taken these reaction rates here, multiplied times the volume to get these, these terms here. Okay. C, sorry. Um, Produced by the first reaction, consumed by the second reaction, consumed by the third reaction, but the stoichiometry here is three. Okay. So that's why you see a three here, right? Because you have to account for the stoichiometry. Okay. It is what it is. Um, all right. So this is a model, assuming I do some simplifications here, right? You can easily take each of these equations. V is a constant. I already showed you right there. So you can divide through all, both three of these equations by volume. And if you do, you get a, a set of equations that look like that. Okay. And you have to specify initial conditions. Initial condition would be you start with some A. You start with some B. You probably don't start with any C. And you'll produce C because of reaction. All right. So this is three differential equations. There's three unknowns here, right? The CA, the CB, and the CC. Um, I say the ODs are fully coupled, meaning if you look at each equation, they depend on CA, CB, and CC. So there's no way to solve them like one at a time or anything like that. And obviously, by solving them, we mean I want you to tell me how these three concentrations depend on time. Okay? Now, if we want to solve a problem like this, obviously, I'd have to give you these initial conditions. I'd have to give you these rate constants. And then you'd have to do this in MATLAB. Because none of the techniques that you learn in differential equations are going to work for this. Okay? First of all, it's three equations, not one. <laughs> Second of all, it's nonlinear, not linear. Okay? So that makes it a little bit challenging. You have to do it numerically. Let me see how much I have here. Okay. All right, so here's one that's gonna twist your mind. Okay. So I and I, I know you've not seen this, and this is gonna look a little bit different, but if you noticed, um, when I when I give you problems, like when we do the theory, I always write derivatives like this. Right? And I say, oh, x can be time or space. But every example I do invariably ends up this. Right? The independent variable is time. Just look back at all the examples. I've given you very few <laughs> examples of where the, the independent variable is a spatial coordinate, not time. So I wanted to do that in this example. Okay? So it's a little bit beyond what you may easily um, understand all the details of it, but um, you'll see it again. Okay, and I just want to get you, I just want to emphasize the fact that differential equations can be either differential equations in time or they can be differential equations that are actually steady state, but things change as a function of position. Okay? So let, take this example here. This is a very common configuration of a reactor that one would use in industry. Okay? So in take, instead of taking the ingredients, meaning the reactants, and putting them in a tank and mixing them all up so it's well mixed, you flow this stuff down a reactor. This is called a plug flow reactor. Okay? You take a reactant here. You, it flows down th this. You have a, a, a volumetric flow rate, so there's a velocity here. And the stuff basically flows along the length of this reactor. If you conceptually, what happens along the length of the reactor, so this is a very simple problem. A goes to B. Okay? So some reactant A reacts to give you some product B. If you plot this, what will eventually be the solution, you're going to plot C, concentration of A and B versus Z. Okay. You can see here, Z is the length along this reactor. Z, Z equals 0 means the entrance. Z equals L, for example, means the exit. Okay. So let's say here's 0 and here's L. Then what's going to happen? At the entrance, a is going to be equal to CAI. How do I know that? Because I, I said so <laughs> right there. Okay? So it's going to equal a, CAI at the entrance. And then what's going to happen is A is going to 
be reacting to go to B, so it's going to decrease along the length of the reactor, something like that. I don't know exactly. Something like that. Okay? And correspondingly, I'm telling you, there's going to be no B to start with, but along the length of the reactor, you're going to start producing B, and it's going to look like that or something. Okay? So this is um, CA and this is CB. Okay? So the point is, nothing's changing in time here. Okay, we're going to assume nothing changes with time, but things change in terms of this position along the reactor Z. Okay? And if you want to predict what's coming out of the reactor, right, which is here, then you have to know how this changes along the length of the reactor. There's no other way. Okay? All right. So in order to get the equations that describe this, I'm going to come up with the simplest possible f problem formulation. First of all, those are the kinetics A goes to B. There's the reaction rate, okay, again, per unit volume. Okay, K times the concentration of A, so you have such a simple th reaction here. We'll assume A has nothing, we'll, sorry, we'll assume this feed stream here, this here has nothing but A. Everything's at steady state. Nothing's changing with time, okay? If, if I allow things to change with time, then they'll change with time and space. Then you'll have something called a partial differential equation. My guess is you guys have never dealt with those, right? In any class? And we're not going to deal with them here either. So we'll assume everything's at steady state. Isothermal. So not, there's no temperature effects along the length of the reactor. You might expect if this was a real reaction, most reactions, but not all, are exothermic. You know this? You know exothermic and endothermic reactions? So if this is an exothermic reaction, it's very likely the temperature increases along the length of the reactor. Um, so you might have a way to remove heat. So we'll just assume that we can remove whatever heat's required to make this isothermal. In other words, the temperature here is the same as the temperature here or anywhere else, okay? And we'll assume all the physical properties are constant, the density, the reaction rate, things like this, all right? Okay. So the question is, how do you go about, so my, here's my proposition. I, the, this is the solution to an equation I'm about to derive for you. And this equation um, is going to be a differential equation and it's going to look like, ultimately, like this. Okay? So the question is, how do I get that equation? Because this looks different than like a tank where things are mixed. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I don't know if you've done this kind of thing in any of your classes, and maybe you don't really start to do this until you take transport. I don't know. But what I'm going to do is something called a differential balance. Have you ever heard of a differential balance? People are like, nope. Okay, that's why I said this is going to twist your mind, okay? I'm going to do a balance over a little slice delta z, right? And then you might imagine if I want a differential equation, then I'm going to take the limit of this as delta z goes to zero and I end up getting a differential equation, okay? So I'm going to show you how that works. And again, this is a little bit beyond, um, so for example, I wouldn't be giving you this problem on a test, let's put it that way, okay? <laughs> Everyone puts down their pen and says, well, <laughs> say no more, okay? <laughs> You still want to be edified, though. So let's look. All right, so there's the picture again. And so what I'm going to do is a, is, is a balance over some little, uh, little piece of this reactor called delta Z. Delta Z is the thickness of this, OK? Um, and so let's see for something that's kind of trivial, even though it looks like there's a lot of math to prove what I'm about to prove. Um, what I'm going to do is do a mass balance, OK? So what I'm saying is, because I'm, at, I'm assuming everything's at steady state, there's no accumulation of mass in this little delta Z strip. That's what I mean by steady state. So if that's true, it means the mass flowing into that little delta Z must, must be equal to the flowing out of the little delta Z. So the little picture here, which I kind of drew, but just so we're all on the same page here, is that I have this. This is thickness um, delta Z. Stuff is flowing like this, OK? So stuff is coming in. The position, it, this is called Z, and this position here is called Z plus delta Z, OK? If there's no accumulation of mass inside there, that means the amount of mass flowing in there has to equal the amount of mass flowing out, because otherwise there's, it's going to accumulate in the control volume, if you want to call it that. You've heard that term, right? This is a differential control volume. <laughs> All right. So what is the mass flowing in here? Well, so I'm assuming the fluid has density rho and has um, mass 
sorry, volumetric flow rate Q, right? So if you take a density times a volumetric flow rate, you get a mass flow rate, okay? So this is the mass flow rate of material coming into this little element, in other words, this right here. And the second term is that that's coming out of that little element. So it's the same thing, except instead of at the point Z, it's at Z plus delta Z, okay? And that has to equal zero, otherwise there's accumulation. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to recognize that I've already said rho is a constant, so in this context that means rho does not change with position along the reactor. So I can pull that rho out and I can say uh, divide through by rho and eliminate rho basically, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this equation by delta z and take the limit as delta z goes to zero, right? It's classic calculus, I think. All right? So if I've, count, I've got rid of the rows, right, now I'm going to divide by delta z, I get this equation, take the limit as delta z goes to zero. So hopefully you know that if you have something like this, q at z minus q at z plus delta z over delta z, take limit as delta z goes to zero, is minus the derivative of q with respect to z. Normally, right, you have the z plus delta z first minus, but this is just the two reverse, so instead of the derivative of q, it's minus the derivative of q, okay? That's just the definition of what you mean by the derivative of q. That's all, okay? So this equation says, and the minus sign isn't really germane here, right? Because we could just multiply through by the minus sign. So it's really saying is the derivative of Q with respect to Z is zero. That does not mean Q is zero. It means it doesn't change with Z, okay? So what that tells me is the flow coming in and the flow e coming out are the same because the flow doesn't change along the length here. It's, it's constant, okay? So whatever the flow is coming in, it'll be the same coming out. And it'll be the same everywhere along the length. Okay, that's all I proved, <laughs> okay? All right, so let's say you want to do a component balance now. This is a little bit different, okay? So now what I want to do is account for Z. Uh, sorry, I'm going to do a balance on the component A. So I need to account for the amount of A flowing in here, the amount of A flowing out here, and the amount of A being generated or lost here, right? I, I'm consuming A according to some reaction rate. So what the A going into this little volume is going to be greater than that coming out, right? Because some of the A is consumed in there, right? Okay. So again, if we look at this, this would be, you know, like grams per liter, whatever, kilograms per meter cubed or whatever you like. This is a volumetric flow rate. So this is the amount of A flowing in, mass per time, okay? This is the amount flowing out of that little element. Again, mass per time. My little pointer seems to be gone. Okay, right there. And then the key thing is how much A is consumed in this little element here, okay? Well, I told you the reaction rate. Okay, so I want to know how much of A is being consumed here. Well, I told you the reaction rate was K times CA, right? Now, of course, it's being consumed. I have a minus sign there. So I'm trying to write, find, and I told you this reaction rate is per unit volume, okay? So I need to know what's the volume of this little element. Well, the cross-sectional area is A, and the thickness is delta Z. So that's the volume of that little element. So if that's the reaction rate per unit volume, that's the reaction rate, like, um, mass per unit, per unit uh, time, okay? Right, because I already told you this reaction rate is going to have, see if I can do it right this time, kilograms.